Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, even though I worked on the 1996 President, President Clinton campaign, in 1992 worked on the Carol Mosley Braun and campaign, but we were also working very closely with the Clinton campaign in a coordinated campaign. I've never been to Little Rock, and I um, have heard so many great things about it from so many friends, and it's really an honor to be here. So I thank you for inviting me, and thank you to Dean Rutherford for inviting me to speak at the Clinton School. It's a real privilege and honor to be here. Um, today I want to talk about the intersection of Jewish public opinion with attitudes towards uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict and a little bit about the 20, 2010 election and how Jewish vote comes into play in, in the election. As Corey mentioned, you know, this is not just uh, an intersection for the issue, but it's also an intersection in my professional and work life, uh, professional life and my personal life as well. And it's something that's very important to me and uh, something that I hope we all can work towards uh, advancing. The, uh, what I find most interesting about this topic is how much misinformation is out there. Just 10 days ago, New York Times op-ed uh, by a columnist named Charles Blow, he wrote that, uh, he wrote a column called Oy Ve Obama. And it was, uh, in which he argued that Jewish public opinion is disproportionately moving against President Obama as a result of his positions uh, on the Middle East conflict, statements about Israel, and his embrace of the Muslim world. And yeah, frankly, it was a rather ridiculous column, but it did appear on the New York Times op-ed page, which, um, uh, which makes it a very important piece of the discussion. And it, uh, but it's reflective of the gap uh, between kind of conjecture and conventional wisdom about Jewish public opinion on the one hand and actual Jewish public opinion on the other. And I, I would start by saying there's three basic myths that uh, about Jewish public opinion. I'll address it in the data very shortly, but I want to just start by identifying these myths for you. The first is that Israel actually plays a central role in Jewish uh, voting behavior. In, in fact, it doesn't. Now, only 10% of Jews cite Israel as one of the top two issues that they vote on in an election. So in other words, 90% don't. Um, the second myth is that Jews tend to be hawkish or hardline on this issue, and when in fact Jews are actually very supportive of the United States playing an active leadership role. They're very uh, supportive of the the different steps it takes, the compromises it takes towards reaching an agreement, and even if it mean, and they're very, very eager to see the U.S. get actively involved, even if it means publicly disagreeing or pressuring uh, both the Palestinians and the Israelis. And the third myth is that President Obama has disproportionately lost his support among American Jews. Uh, in fact, decline in support for President Obama is no different than decline among the over, uh, among Jews is no different than the decline in support for him among the overall population. And as an uh, active Democrat, I'm sorry to say that it has been declining um, across, across the board, but there's no difference between Jews and non-Jews in terms of the way this is uh, playing out. I arrived at these judgments and these assessments based on public opinion research that uh, Gallup has conducted, public opinion research that uh, my firm has conducted for various advocacy organizations. and. And that's, that's where we come out on this. And I'll jump into it with data uh, to explain and, and, and kind of pour more into it. And then we'll open it up for questions and answers later. And I'll also show you some television commercials that are taking place in, in a Senate race and uh, going on right now that kind of highlight some of the silliness, some of the ridiculousness that comes around in this issue. But to start with, the, start, the starting point here is that American Jews are extraordinarily supportive of Democratic candidates. Okay, these are exit polls conducted since going back to 1932, and I promise you I'm not going to go back that far in, in this presentation. But what you can see on this particular piece of data is that starting when President Clinton was elected, we've basically seen Jewish support in the mid-70s to up to 80 percent supporting Democratic candidates. The, there was a period between 1968 and 1988 when support uh, had dropped, but that support even basically was in the mid-60s. I mean, this is, there was the one real blip in there is 1980 when there were three candidates. President Carter had, uh, um, 
President Carter did very poorly in that election. He got only 45% of the Jewish vote. But the, the, the story here over time is that Jews are among the most supportive core based uh, constituencies for the Democratic Party. That has remained unchanged. And in 2008, despite a very vicious campaign that was going on against President Obama, um, you know, attacks on him, uh, insinuating that he was Muslim and thus anti-Israel and uh, all sorts of really kind of nasty emails going through uh, uh, being spread online. He still got 78% of the vote, which was comparable to where Al Gore, what Al Gore and Joe Lieberman, an Orthodox Jew on the ticket, got. So uh, we've kind of seen this, this story before, these, uh, the sense that, uh, that support is falling among American Jews for President Obama or for a Democratic candidate in general. And we're hearing it again right now. I'll show you right now why I don't see it, it, uh, why I don't see it moving. I mentioned this in the beginning. The, we asked people in, 2000, uh, in March of 2010, we said, what are the two most important issues in deciding your vote for Congress this election? And not surprisingly, the economy is the number one choice. 55% said that their, their vote was going to be determined based on uh, a candidate's position on how to handle, how to address the economy. The second most important was health care at 41%. What this says is that the support for Democratic candidates among American Jews is rooted in common values and shared values on things that matter to them on a daily basis. You go down the list, uh, after the economy and health care, like it, it is with most Americans, the, the, it drops off a lot. But Israel doesn't come down until you get to t uh, about sixth or seventh on the list, where it's 10% cited as an issue. Those 10% I've referred to as, as among the, the loudest 10% uh, on the planet uh, in terms of how we see this debate played out. But they also tend to be very Republican, very hawkish, very, uh, and, and are not really kind of voters that are up for grabs. The, uh, as you go down the list, you see other issues. But it's also noteworthy that Iran is at the bottom, because that's an issue that comes up a lot in this discussion. That actually is very similar to where Iran comes up as an issue for the American electorate overall. Um, again. People, I do focus groups around the country uh, for political candidates, and people are hurting out there. The economy is, and I don't have to tell you this, and people, the economy is terrible. It is not getting better for most people. It doesn't matter if they're you know, upper income, if they're lower income, their, cha their lifestyle has changed. They've cut back on a whole range of, of things that they're accustomed to doing. And what people are voting on are the things that affect them on a daily basis. Um, even the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have, have dropped in terms of priority. There's a sense that the Iraq war, you know, that you just aren't hearing about it as much, not hearing about it, you know, to the extent people hear about Afghanistan, it's just feeding a, a sense that we're spending too much money abroad, we're not spending enough uh, and, and not investing enough at home. Obviously, these are very important issues for the country, but in terms, and, and people care about these issues and people are very concerned about our, our, um, uh, our soldiers that are overseas. But they are not, right now, this is not a voting issue for them the way Iraq was in, in 2006 or 2008. And for, like I said, for uh, the American Jewish population in particular, it's about the economy and health care. It's not about Israel. Now let's come back to the, those two myths that I mentioned, two of the three myths that I mentioned in the beginning. And the first being that Obama is losing ground, uh, or the first was that he's losing ground because of Israel. Well, as I showed you, Israel's not the big issue. But second of all, he's not disproportionately losing ground among American Jews. That blue line going down starting at 77, this is from a Gallup poll, the blue line that starts at 77 back in uh, 2009 was his 77% job approval among American Jews. At the same time, it was 63% job approval among all Americans. Today, both have dropped significantly. His job approval overall in the United States is 48%. And his job approval among American Jews is 61%. So we've seen a decline of about 15 or 16% in his job approval, both among American Jews and among the population overall. So, and we're seeing this across a lot of constituencies. So the big takeaway here is that, yes, he's, he's declining. He's declining at the same rate among different constituencies. But from the uh, from perspective of American Jews, he's, got, uh, he's still about 13 points stronger with American Jews than he is with the public overall. 
want to move to the third myth that I mentioned about Jews being, being hawkish. Um, we ask, we get at this in a couple of different ways. The first thing we did, and this is from a, a survey conducted for an organization called J Street, which is uh, calling itself the pro-Israel, pro-peace uh, political movement. They're trying to push the American government to be more aggressive to help the parties make the compromises necessary to reach a peace agreement. So we, we spend a lot of time talking about what's America's interest and, and how do we get, uh, how do we show, how do we understand whether or not American Jews are supportive of, of the U.S. playing an active role. So we ask here is a three-step question, a three-step exercise. The first step is we ask them, do you support the United States playing an active role to help the parties resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict? And that's what you see over there on the far left is two bars. In March of 2009, 88% said, yeah, we support it. And, 80, and in March of 2010, 82% said, yes, I support the U.S. playing an active role to resolve the conflict. That's a very easy thing to say yes to. Of course you want the United States to play an active role. That's our baseline. That's the ceiling. We then make it a tougher ask. And so the second step of this exercise is to say, okay, and these are those middle graphs, those middle bars, would you support, still support the U.S. playing an active role, even if it means publicly disagreeing with both sides? And support drops from 88% to 76%, or more recently, it's, a, it's dropped from 82% to 73%. And so we said, okay, that's a, that's a lot, three quarters. Let's push it even harder. What if it means the U.S. exerting pressure on both sides? And you ask pressure. And in that, support drops to 72% in March of 09 or 71% in March of 2010. The reason I have so many bars up there is not to confuse you or bombard you with numbers, but to, to make a couple of points. One is that, yes, support drops off as the test gets harder, but even when the test gets hard, it still remains very strong. And the second reason is I want to show the difference between March of 2009 and March of 2010. Because what happened between March of 2009 and March of 2010? Yeah, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of debate, a lot of discussion going on about the U.S. role in the Middle East. And there were some big events that happened. I mean, there, there was this big argument with, uh, between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu over the uh, settlements, the West Bank settlements, in which a lot of these voices, like the, the column, you know, were similar or reflecting the opinions uh, expressed in that column I mentioned in the New York Times that said, you know, President Obama's pushing Israel too hard. They're, you know, he's, he's, it's, it's, they're our ally. He's, he's alienating them. He's not being supportive enough. And this was a big piece of kind of the public debate among the people who pay attention to this issue. It didn't move. It didn't move these numbers. Even going back further, we've asked this question in 2008, and the numbers were pretty much the same. Between 2008 and now, there was a war in Gaza that you know, was a very hard war with a lot of controversy. Didn't move, didn't move these numbers. We had a change in government in America, a change in government in Israel. These, things, these numbers don't move. These are, my point is that these are very firmly held beliefs. Uh, and it's not, we, we don't, just the latest events isn't going to really shift public opinion on it. People are paying attention to it, but they're not, um, they're not moved by the latest controversy and the latest um, the latest crisis. Now, we did ask an even harder test, and this is, um, this is also done for this uh, organization called J Street, is they're trying to figure out the best way to communicate their message of, of, of supporting Israel, and, but pushing both parties to move towards peace. And what they did, the way we asked in this question, is you've seen those two numbers on the far left, the, the active role, and even if it means disagreeing with both sides. But then what we did, then did for half the sample, they got the question, well, what does it mean even if, you disagree, if, uh, even if the U.S. disagrees with Israel? We didn't say disagree with both sides. We said just disagree with Israel, publicly disagree with Israel. And support drops to 52%. We also asked on the far right, you can see, what if, uh, uh, would you still support the U.S. playing an active role even if it means exerting pressure on Israel? So half the sample got both, you know, exerting pressure or publicly disagreeing with both sides. The other half of the sample just got exerting pressure or publicly disagreeing with Israel. And what you see is, here and here, those are the sides where it's, just, where it's just disagreeing or exerting pressure on Israel. The support drops significantly. It's still 50%. And you have a very divided Jewish, uh, Jewish community over this. But it's 
nowhere near the, the 70s that you saw when it's holding both sides accountable. And the lesson for, uh, for ad peace advocates and for people when they're talking about this is to understand that, it, uh, particularly when uh, you're talking with certain constituencies, in this case the, the Jewish constituency, that it is important to talk about holding both sides accountable because when one side uh, sees them being singled out, it, it's an alienating dynamic. Okay. So then we said, okay, people say, well, that's American role. Well, what about the details of the agreement? Where are people on the, on the actual compromises that both sides need to, take, to, need to make uh, to reach peace? And what we did, this is a survey from March of 2009, in which we asked people, and I don't expect you to read all of this, I can summarize it for you, um, but we basically put the peace proposal that was on the table at Camp David when President Clinton brought uh, Yasser Arafat and Ehud Barak to Camp David to negotiate a final status agreement. Uh, the United States put forth uh, a set of parameters called the Clinton parameters. These, these details basically are what a final status agreement looks like. Um, it even got more advanced as they went into deeper negotiations six months later in, in Taba, in Taba, Egypt. The bottom line of this, we read people this, uh, this agreement. We said eight years ago, Israelis and Palestinians American negotiators came together. They came very close to reaching a, an agreement, but ultimately it failed. Let me read you the details and tell me whether you support it or oppose it. And it talks about the main issues, state, Palestinian statehood, borders, land swaps to accommodate for some of the settlements that would be brought into Israel, but so taking some Israeli territory and, and transferring it to Palestinians, so there's an equal swap of land. It talks about Jerusalem you know, a final status solution in, in Jerusalem, talks about refugees. The, the basic, the key pieces of final status uh, agreement that are hard things for both sides to swallow, and ultimately we ask people, do you support or oppose this? And 76% say that they support the agreement compared to 24% who oppose the agreement. So the, when you ask people on their own, you know, do you support the the division of Jerusalem, do you support refugees, do you, you know, comp compensation to ref refugees, giving land. When you talk about in those terms on individual pieces, piece of people, the support is not nearly as high. But when you talk about it as a comprehensive peace agreement, comprehensive package, then uh, people have a very strong support, as you see. And that's, that's the overriding dynamic here in, uh, when it comes to add towards, attitudes towards the compromises that are necessary for both sides to reach an agreement. Now this may seem, or may not, depending on how, how much you follow, follow this, but this may seem counterintuitive to what you're used to hearing about, the, about Jewish public opinion. And I would say that it's, it's not, you know, I, I, everything in here is, is fairly cut and dry, but there is a lot of nuance as well that people need to uh, take into account. And it, um, I'll start with the when there is a, um, a crisis, it doesn't, as I mentioned before, it doesn't change the way people view their fund, their underlying, it doesn't change their underlying beliefs or values on the issue. But what it does do is there may be a temporary rallying behind the flag effect. We saw it recently on the um, uh, flotilla controversy that happened. And, but we asked right after the Gaza war, or a few months after the Gaza war, we asked people if they approve or disapprove of the recent military action that Israel took in Gaza. And after seeing all these numbers that I just presented, you may say, wow, they're probably not going to be too crazy about it because of all the, the loss of life and, and, and property that took place in Gaza. But, it, but it's not that simple. In fact, be, Israel, you know, they, there, there was a uh, very serious military action that took place in Gaza. A lot of, a lot of people's lives were, were lost. It was not, you know, Israel um, at the time, had, there had been a lot of rocket attacks coming from, from Gaza into southern Israel. This was the response. And we asked people, do they support or oppose the, the military action? And 75% supported it. 75% of American Jews supported the military action compared to 25%. Now, that reflects a bit of the rallying behind the, the flag during a time of war effect. But what we then asked them, because we know there's nuance in this, we said, well, was it effective? Did it, did it make Israel, um, did the action that Israel take in Gaza make it more secure, less secure, or have no impact on Israel's security? 
So while 75% supported the action, only 41% said it made Israel more secure. And then when you combine the number who said that the, the, gray, fa the gray number there, which says no impact, 41% said no impact, and 18% said less secure. So basically you have 59% of American Jews saying the Gaza action made Israel, either had no impact or made Israel less secure. This is among people who supported the action. Okay, so you can see there's some, there's some emotional attachment. You know, there's an emotional rally behind the flag uh, effect going on when they're at a time of war, um, as you would see anywhere. And, but there was also a questioning of the wisdom of the action, whether it was effective. I'll raise another issue here, and that is, I, at the beginning I mentioned that, you know, only 10% of American Jews believe that Israel, or cite Israel as a voting issue for them. And, but it also, it's a little more complicated than that. We ask people, is it an important issue for you? Okay, and we asked people, this was in 2008 in the lead up to the presidential election, and 58% said a candidate's position on Israel plays a big role in determining how I will vote, compared to 34% say a candidate's position on Israel will not play a big role. So what does this tell us? Because only 10% are saying that they actually are going to vote on it, but 58% are saying that it plays a big role. What it tells us is, is a, it's a threshold issue. If somebody is good enough, quote, good enough, and supportive enough of Israel, then they quickly move on to the issues that do matter to them. And it's a fairly low threshold to pass as a result of all the other data that I showed you on, on how their views are, on how they want to see the U.S. playing an active role, how they, how they support a lot of the, uh, they support the compromises that go behind a final status agreement. So that's the kind of the, the nuance that I wanted to, um, uh, to draw out a little bit more. I mean, it, it is very clear that American Jews do support it an active U.S. effort. Uh, they support the U.S. pushing both sides to make compromises to resolve the conflict. Um, they, do, they don't want to feel Israel being singled out. They do want to feel that someone has an, uh, uh, an, in, uh, an inherent or an intrinsic support for Israel. Um, but they, they're, they're willing to see public disagreement and they're, willing to, and, they're, and they're eager to see the U.S. assert America's interests uh, to, re, to reach a peace agreement. How does this play out in the vote? So in the 2010 election, and I'm sorry to say to the fellow Democrats in the room that right now it looks very difficult for us, um, but for the Republicans in the room, I say, you probably, I, I know where you feel, I know where you're coming, how you felt in 2006 and 2008, but, uh, uh, but as it plays to the, to the Jewish vote, there, right now the Jewish vote is kind of where you would expect it. Gallup, what Gallup did is they aggregated from all their uh, polls that they're conducting on a, on a regular basis. They broke it down by various constituencies. And right now, it's kind of where you would expect it. 62% say they would vote for the Democrat, 28% for the Republican, the rest undecided. Base constituencies tend to report lower early uh, at this point in the election. When you take the undecided vote, Gallup allocates it based on their party identification. The, that number, that 62% number rises to 69% basically where you would expect it in this particular political environment among um, uh, a constituency that is supportive, as supportive of, uh, of a particular party the way the, Jew the Jewish community is supportive of the Democratic Party. So we know the role that, really the inconsequential role that Israel plays in, in the Jewish vote and the, uh, and I hate to say the inconsequential role that the Jewish vote plays in, in the election overall, but it really does gather a lot of attention. It's producing New York Times op-eds. It's also producing television ads. And I'll, I'm going to show you, I'll, hold on one second, I'll show in a, uh, for a second, but I want to just show you some ads that kind of draw out the silliness of the issue. And I'll, I do this as a little bit of a, maybe entertainment value, but also to, to kind of let you see th these ads are consuming the energy and time of people who are focused on this issue in, in a very uh, big and slightly disturbing way. Uh, and you'll understand what I mean when, when you see the ads. But why don't we, um, if you could start, Nikolai, with, um, let's start with clip one.
Emergency Committee for Israel is founded by Gary Bauer and Bill Kristol. <laughs> I, I like to say Bill, Bill Kristol, the people who brought the emergency in Iraq have now brought the Emergency Committee for Israel. But um, this ad is running in Pennsylvania, which is a very closely contested congressional uh, Senate race between Joe Sestek and, and Pat Toomey. It's also running in, uh, as of right now, I believe in two or three other districts. I know in, in Columbus, Ohio, where Mary Jo Kilroy is, is running for Congress, and in Connecticut, where uh, Jim Himes is running for re-election in Congress. This is, uh, I, I believe that this is an issue that we're the Bill Crystals of the world, the, and I would say I would say the the right wing is trying to take advantage of the fact that this is a bad year for Democrats, and they're going to run ads like this, and they're going to say, "See, this is what happens if you if you uh, you know if you're pushing U.S. involvement in the Middle East, in in the Arab-Israeli conflict, if you're not just towing the traditional line, and uh, we're going to run ads against you, and you're, and this is going to be the reason you lose." I can as I can tell you from the data, this is not why they would lose, but this is this ad is running. And Nikolai, if you could turn to uh, clip number three, I'll show you another ad uh, along those lines. Someone actually paid money to put that on TV. Um, it's, yeah, it is. Uh, it's unfortunate. It's. Uh, it's. I, I believe it's silly. It's. It's inconsequential in the election. But this is. This is what goes into this debate, and, and which fires up the people who are involved in this debate. Uh, I'll show you one response ad and talk a little bit about uh, uh, Congressman Sestek in a second. If you could go to clip number four. So, I mean, you get the idea that money is being spent on this. It could be spent on a lot of other things uh, uh, with a lot more value. But this is, this is the nature of the debate, and this is what's going on. Um, yeah, the, the people who ran that ad I'm, uh, are a client of mine, and, I, uh, this, and they're actually the ones who did a lot of the, uh, commissioned a lot of the research that I've talked about. But the point that I want to make is that there's a sense that you have to respond to an attack because you don't want it to, to hold, and you, you want to show... Um, people like Joe Sestek, that when they go out and they support your positions, that when they're attacked, that somebody's going to be there to, to defend you, and it just kind of keeps escalating and escalating, and it's uh, it is unfortunate. The uh, the last thing I would leave you with is, and, and the real unfortunate thing is, is he is, is Congressman Sestek is you know former admiral of the U.S. Navy who is at, in that position did enormous things to support Israel to support the peace process. It was a um, key part of President Clinton's administration, and it's, um, uh, you know, we've seen attacks on, on, on people like this before, and it's just, uh, it's, it's an unfortunate part of the process. The last thing I would say is the presidential vote. Okay, 2012, we did ask, who would you vote for, Barack Obama or Sarah Palin? Now, <laughs> you laugh, but, <laughs> but why Sarah Palin? Okay. Well, two reasons. One is she actually, uh, she actually has a lot of strength with Republicans. And um, it's, it, it, it may not be a laughing matter. I mean, she is, um, you know, she was the vice president, uh, vice presidential nominee. She is uh, leading, you know, she uh, has a lot of support uh, within the Republican Party and looks like she may be running for president. I would not discount the possibility of her getting the, the nomination. Second reason that she was chosen for, for this hypothetical, uh, hypothetical matchup, she's also been extraordinarily outspoken on this issue. Um, 
she uh, she's done interviews, I believe, with Barbara Walters most recently, uh, or was it, it may have been Diane Sawyer, in which uh, she attacked the Obama administration for putting for asking Israel to stop uh, the settlements in the West Bank, which is where U.S. policy has been for many years, and. She, uh, she was very outspoken on it, she has been outspoken on it, and she is trying to, you know, quote, make a play for, uh, for, for various constituencies' votes, but not uh, amongst, I would say, is the, is the Jewish vote. And we look here, in a hypothetical matchup, it's 70 percent for President Obama and 18 percent for Sarah Palin. And again, I, I would suggest that that number would rise in the, in the context of an actual campaign. Anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll cut it, I'll, I'll leave it there, and just to uh, be able to open up for, for discussion. Uh, let's, uh, let's wait for the microphones here. Um, let everybody get in, get in place. Caroline, let's, uh, let's start with uh, Rabbi Levy over there. He probably has a good question. Even, even though the um, congressional elections are what I guess are on our mind immediately, when it comes to the presidential elections, especially looking backwards and maybe ahead, isn't it true that both Republican and Democratic nominees have generally been pro-Israel? And so you can't say, well, you should vote for Bush or you should vote for Reagan because he's pro-Israel. Look at the other side. I don't know of any non-supportive Israel candidate that's ever run. I, I would agree with that completely. And in, in it underscores... And it, it underscores that the attacks against President Obama during the campaign for not being supportive of Israel were discounted by most people saying, are you kidding? He is supportive of Israel. We did ask a question saying who is better, uh, who, uh, let's say, who's better. The, the exact phrasing I don't have at the tip of my tongue, but it was along the lines of who would do a better job uh, in terms of supporting Israel. John McCain or Barack Obama. We asked this among American Jews, and McCain came out with a slight majority on it. He only got 22 percent of the Jewish vote. I mean, it, it, it's, it's exactly what you said. once you pass that threshold, which I noted, it's a fairly easy threshold to pass. People then move to issues that are, and and they vote overwhelmingly for the for the Democrat. Questions? Yes, ma'am. I am wondering if you uh, do any uh, work with those people who would measure religious, the religious beliefs of your respondents. I'm thinking of the major funding by very conservative Christians funding for the settlements. Mm -hmm. And as Narcanson, um, I was aware and kind of embarrassed uh, that Mike Huckabee, I believe it was last year, uh, went to mm -hmm. the occupied territories to consecrate Palestinian land that had been bulldozed for the creation of new Israeli settlements. Mm -hmm. Is there a breakdown based on, you've, you've done a lot of work with the Jewish vote. Right. What about very conservative Christians? It's a, it's a great question. I haven't done uh, public opinion research with a, you know, that asks these questions among evangelical Christians. Uh, the best I can point to is the, um, is the activities of Governor Huckabee, of Sarah Palin, but also of uh, uh, John Hagee. I'm sure that name rings a bell for many. Yeah. We did do a lot of questions about uh, John Hagee and the, the role he has played. He has a, an organization called um, Christians United for Israel. And he's been a prominent speaker at Jewish events for organizations that are kind of supporting the uh, Israel policy no matter what. And it became a rallying cry for the other groups that I've been talking about that are trying to push the peace process, saying this is the kind of person, you know, the person who said New Orleans was, deserved what it got because of the uh, behavior of its, of its citizens, that you know, this is the kind of person that you want trying to call for support of Israel, and on top of that, funding all these, uh, all these things that are damaging the peace process and, and undermining peace. 
So I can't speak to directly to your question as to what popular opinion is among the people that they purport to represent. I can say that there is a divergence between popular opinion among what a lot of Jewish organizations among the people among the Jewish organizations on the one hand and the people they purport to represent on the other hand. So I don't know if it's the same there, but um, it would be a very interesting study. Yes, we have a question in the back. Yes, back there. Wait for the, wait for the mic, please. What expectations do you have or what are you expecting from the meeting to kickstart right. uh, negotiations again this week? So yes, as, as many of you know, there's uh, direct negotiations will be held in Washington between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. And it's the first time they've had negotiations between the Israeli government and the Palestinian government in, since 2008. First time since Prime Minister Netanyahu has been in office. and. It's hard to say where it's going to go. Um, on the one hand, I think it is a great development that they are sitting at the table. Uh, on the other hand, there's been so much posturing leading up to the talks. That's typical, but it's, uh, but it's uncertain as to whether or not it's going to uh, produce something. I think it's great that they're at the table. I think it's important. I think that Secretary of State Clinton has a very important role to play here, and she's really the right person for it in terms of knowledge and, and credibility and the ability to, to push both sides. So I, I, as someone who seeks it, I'm very hopeful. As someone who's been through it a few times, I'm cautiously <laughs> hopeful. Uh, it will require, we can talk a little bit, I'll, uh, do we have, my, I'll take a minute to talk a little bit about the dynamics in Israel. I um, recently did public opinion research in Israel. The public there it's comparable to, and a lot of the dynamics is comparable to what I've shown you here, that when they look at an overall peace agreement, they're very supportive of it. When you look at the individual components of it, you know, breaking it down each compromise by compromise, they don't like it. And, but, with, but what is constant throughout the, the constant theme throughout the research is that if the government of Israel signs a peace agreement, they will su support it, particularly this government because it's a, uh, it's a Likud-led government, and they trust Prime Minister Netanyahu would never sign something that would endanger Israeli security. Whatever he signs, they will be for. And we also ask, well, well, I'll stop there for a second. So whatever he signs, they'll be for. The problem is in Israel, whatever he signs, his coalition that he's chosen to assemble will not necessarily be for. And so he's, if he decides to go for it, he has to make a decision. Is to, uh, I would say the, the public opinion will be behind him. But he will need to change his coalition and bring in some of the parties from the opposition that support the peace process and lose some of the people within the coalition who are against it. So it's, very, it, it, it's, it's a calculation that he will have to make, assuming that they get to a deal that, they, uh, that, he, that is acceptable to him and obviously acceptable to the Palestinians. He, oh, but he has the ability to, to pass it with the public pure, just simply by uh, shaking up the coalition. We did ask one other thing in that question. We said, okay, let's say he accepts it. It's an American proposal. Uh, the Palestinians accept it and he rejects it because of, he says it, it doesn't allow for Israeli security and it divides Jerusalem. The two things that are most difficult for Israelis to, to swallow. We ask, would you support, and, uh, would you support his decision to reject an American proposal. And it was split 50-50, which I think is a very good sign, actually, that if the U.S., that the more the, the, that the, the U.S. can push and can push very hard because the Israeli public does not want a conflict with the United States. They see the United States as the only real option out there as, a, as an ally that can support it internationally, you know, financially, militarily, in international institutions, and they don't want to create uh, the kind of rift that would result from rejecting the American proposal. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of reasons to kind of be hopeful, but a lot of reasons to, I'll just say, be very cautious in, 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 the, in the hope. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you uh, said about the items in the peace accord, you know, that uh, there's rejection, are there any of them that are uh, at least somewhat acceptable? And then just moving deeper, if they don't, if they reject the items, are there any uh, 
suggestions, either from the uh, Israeli Jews or American Jews, of what then would they do to make it work? Well, the first answer is really the whole package is the best way to present this and the best way to, both from a policy point of view, but also from a politics point of view. It's, it's very hard for people to make interim compromises along the way. Violence continues. What are we, what are we making these compromises for? It's not, it's not producing anything good. But your question is, which of the individual items are really the, the easy ones and which are the tough ones, right? And so the, the easier ones are borders. People are, you know, the, the idea of, of, of exchanging land for peace, while it was tab a taboo before the Oslo process, before 1993, uh, has, that taboo has been broken. And people are very comfortable, very easy with that. The, the harder pieces are most, the most difficult piece is Jerusalem. And there is an emotional attachment that uh, American Jews have towards Jerusalem. There's emotional attachment that Muslims have towards Jerusalem and Christians have towards Jerusalem as well. We're talking right now about the, the Jewish constituency. They, there is a very strong attachment as the capital of the Jewish people. And that one, when we asked about that in a, in a poll question, it was a 44% support, uh, support a compromise on Jerusalem, 56% oppose, which is very different than the overall numbers that I showed you, which speaks to the importance of doing this as a, as a comprehensive deal. It also speaks to the, the difficulty in particular on Jerusalem and how that inflames a lot of the passions. One of the things we've seen very, is when Vice President Biden was over in Israel several months ago, I believe it was in February or March of, of this year, while he was there, the Israeli Ministry of, in, of the Interior announced new housing developments in East Jerusalem, which go against US, official US policy and was a big embarrassment for the Vice President to be there in the region and seeing, you know, the government of Israel doing something that opposed, that, that is against uh, U.S. policy while he's over there trying to have a goodwill visit. And on the, but what was very interesting is we did ask, we did do a survey after that event. There was a lot of controversy around it. The, um, President Obama, Secretary of State Clinton ex uh, publicly expressed their their, you could say, anger, dissatisfaction, frustration with the Israeli government for doing it at that time. And it, it, again, in the world that follows this, it was a big controversy, big deal. We asked people, did they support or oppose the U.S. strongly criticizing the Israeli action? And 55% said they, they supported it, which spoke volumes because this was on Jerusalem. If it were on another issue, it would have been way over 55%. But even on Jerusalem, 55% supported the, the U.S. position on it and, and, and reaction, and it speaks to also the importance of U.S. leadership and how American Jews see that as so important. So that may be a little bit longer of an answer than you were bargaining for. But I guess it's a, Thank you. Going? I've got a couple of questions. Sure. One is just a real general, simple question. That is, if the U.S. is pro-Israel, if the U.S. President's and administration are pro-Israel, then how can they be an impartial peace negotiator with Israel? Second question is, do you know about how much monetary support about we what? provide, about how much monetary support the U.S. provides to Israelis, to, to Israel, and are and our, the uh, Palestinians per year? The U, as a result of the Camp David Accords uh, in 1979, the U.S. provides, I believe, $3 billion in aid to Israel and to Egypt as a consequence of that accord. The dollar amount for the Palestinians, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, it's always controversial. It's always under review, and there are various members of Congress use it as a political football. To, uh, but it, it, but it, it has been coming, and um, I know it's needed, and it has an impact, but I don't know the, the amount off the top of my head. In terms of being an uh, impartial broker, this is a comp this is a difficult uh, scenario. It is they are you know, the U.S. is perceived as supporting Israel around the world. Support is perceived that among the Palestinian uh, leadership, Palestinian people, and but they're also the U.S. is also the only game in town, and it makes the U the U.S. is the only power out there that is able to bring the parties together, and it needs to. 
and as a result, the, both sides come to the table. I would say that the Netanyahu government would question, has questioned publicly, how much Obama is supporting Israel. Uh, I think they're false. They're, they're questioning it falsely, and they're doing it in a, in, in a in a way that is not productive. But the the speech that President Obama gave in Cairo, I think, went a long way toward starting to change attitudes uh, about towards the United States. Uh, it's it's certainly still perceived as supporting one side more than the other, but particularly in the wake of what happened under President Bush, for Obama to extend and and at, in his speech he and this was very important in his speech in Cairo, he said he he, he said that he he faulted both sides. He said both sides need to recognize the legitimacy uh, of the aspirations of the other side, and to do this in Cairo and speaking to the audience there and saying, you know, we need, you need to support, you need to understand the legitimate aspirations of the Israeli people. It's a very strong statement, but he also said it uh, on the flip side toward the, the role that the U.S. will play to help bring an agreement and look out for the interests of everybody in the region. So it's, I think you hit, you hit, you hit, a, a, hit a dynamic right on, hit the nail on the head on the dynamic but that the U.S. is, in the end of the day, the only game in town, and the leadership needs to do a good job of showing both sides that they're that they're going to be they're going to be fair. Spencer, first of all, thank you for coming um, on behalf of the Clinton School students here. Um, I had a question: If y'all have any research based on solely Jewish youth and their opinions on Israel and the conflict? And how, if if there are any discrepancies between that and overall Jewish opinion? Okay, and also say now I just noticed all the people standing are students, so you guys got the the short end here. But um, within our samples, we are able to look at the different age breakdowns. And when you look at the under 30, and even under 40, it's a it's an aging population, so we can look at it the under 40. Um, the there's an important dynamic. There's, you have to look at it in two segments. One is the orthodox population, and the other is the non-orthodox population. The orthodox population is a very, it has a lot more kids than the non-orthodox population, so they're disproportionately young. When you, they're also disproportionately hawkish. And so when you break it out and look at the, at the non-orthodox uh, population under 40, they're even more supportive, more progressive on these issues. And what, particularly on that chart I showed you where about um, it peel, support peeling off, or you, uh, that where you asked the easy question, do you support this one? So where it peels off, it, 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 young people are less inclined to peel off when you make the test harder. It, again, though, the key dynamic is it, young people who are not orthodox. The Orthodox population, actually young and old, tends to be part of that, the people who oppose it from the beginning. But if they don't oppose it from the beginning, they're the first ones to drop off. Okay. I think Jim's got a question behind you, Thesha. I, I was wondering uh, if you have a religious affiliation yourself, and if so, how do you keep that from influencing the outcome of your research? Uh, I am Jewish. A lot of my friends are Jewish. <laughs> I am. Some of my best friends are Palestinians too. You know but um, how do I influence it? It's. Uh, I mean, every researcher is going to bring their own personal experiences into what they're doing. Most of my research is done for progressive nonprofit organizations or, or Democratic candidates running for office. My job is to provide good research that helps and uh, help. Uh, develop sound strategies for either winning an election or or helping to influence public opinion in a way that uh, advances your advocacy group's objectives. So I can't do if I if I'm not being if I'm if I'm allowing those experiences to bias the, the questions or or the the produce questions right questions that produce a biased result because the questions were not properly written. I'm not doing a service to the causes I believe in or the, the candidates that I'm working for. So what we do is we, we often will run our questions by other colleagues 
say, does this seem balanced to you? Does this seem like the, we're, act, we're capturing the debate properly? And people say yes, no, you know, we, we, we can adjust accordingly. But it's, um, it's a very important thing. I mean, the research is no good if it's, if it's no good. And so uh, whether it's something on an issue like this or, or a candidate I'm working for, we strive very hard to. to I have a question back here. Hi, I'm Nikki Hamilton from the Clinton School, and Hi. I was just wondering on the religion question, like, what have you um, learned from previous failed negotiations about the importance of including um, religious leaders? So in other words, like, how are you ensuring that all the religious stakeholders um, have a say in the peace process? I mean, I, there's a couple of things. One is on a policy basis. If you are trying to resolve a conflict in another country or another part of the world, it's very important certainly to hear from the people in, in that part of the world and who represent the different sides and the different sides within the different sides. And you know, the different religious groups come into play there. Where I, where, where I saw this most important is on the issue of Jerusalem because it is, it is the home or is a, is a uh, very important place for, for Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And they've brought in advisors from all three religions to understand better uh, the policy ramifications, the history, and why these things are so emotional for people. From that, I, I characterize that kind of in the substance policy end of things. There is the political end of things, uh, and here in, in America, it's you know it is essential to make the different constituencies that are invested, as you call them, stakeholders invested in this. Uh, in this issue to feel that their voice is being heard and the White House will do different things to reach out to the different constituencies uh, inviting organizational leaders in for meetings to discuss issues to from you know from 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 that level to also just communicate sending communications out speaking at the annual events of different organizations um, it's, it's an important role both on the political and the policy aspects of it. Let's, uh, let's give Jim a round of applause and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.